is um, called Reach Out, and it's three parts. We started last week, we'll be in that series this week, and we'll be finishing it next week. And last week, we, we tried to lay a foundation for why we need to reach out to people who do not yet know Jesus Christ. And we said that the foundation we need is absolute dependence on God himself because this mission that we are about is ultimately his mission. The mission to reach a non-Christian is because God so loved the world that he chose to send his only son. So we must trust in the mission giver. We come into his mission and we have to trust in him and depend on him because we need his power, we need the Holy Spirit, we need to go to him in prayer. We cannot do anything without God. And it's, it's really important just to say that again because everything that will follow today and next week is based on that foundation. Okay, I'm just going to go back here. Okay. I wanted to be close to you guys. I feel a little far back here. But, uh, let's see how it goes. So, this morning, we are we're looking at building relationships. During our prayer time, we pray before the, the service from about 8.30, uh, just in the Banda Bay. Uh, Alice was with us, and Alice said, I hope that as the series goes on, we can get a little bit more practical as to how we can actually reach those who are not followers of Jesus. Because last week was, was kind of about setting this foundation, this framework of trusting in God. And she was right on target because hopefully this week we can get more practical. Because uh, it's all well and good to say trust in God. But then how do we actually move from there? So today, we are looking at building relationships. Building relationships as a way of reaching out to those who are not followers of Jesus. And it doesn't get more practical than actually having to build a relationship with someone who's not following Jesus. It doesn't get more practical than that. So we'll look at two questions. First question is, why do we build relationships? So what, what is the reason for that? And secondly, how do we actually go about this? Let's begin with that first question as to why do we build relationships? And the, the simple answer or the straightforward answer is we build relationships because that's what Jesus did. If, if you look at the life of Jesus Christ and ask yourself, how did Jesus go about reaching people who did not yet believe in him. A big part of the answer would be Jesus built relationships with them. He would intentionally reach out and get to know people and make them a part of his life. So there's many ways we can reach non-Christians. But as a church, we would like to spend this next two weeks focusing specifically on how each of us can be part of that and today specifically by building relationships with non-Christians. So if we read uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 to 13, this is what it says. It says, and as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus. Okay. 
Let's open this one step. And as Jesus reclined the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus had called Matthew, and Matthew was a tax collector, and said, Matthew, come and follow me. And this was, it was huge. It was a big thing, because in that time, as we said last week, tax collectors were, were really outsiders. In fact, uh, one New Testament commentator by the name of Alan Paul says this. He says, being a tax collector in those days usually involved working for the hated imperial power or the equally hated noble dictator Herod. Tax collectors were usually greedy, dishonest, and immoral. Worse still, to a Jew, they were ceremonially unclean through mixing continuously with non-Jewish people. But Jesus, who but Jesus, would call a man like this to be his follower? These were the outsiders, the, the, the very lowest as far as what people perceived in terms of morality and social norms, tax collectors were at the bottom of the social run. But Jesus doesn't end at only calling Matthew. Jesus goes to Matthew's house and hangs out with Matthew and his friends. He hangs out with Matthew and other tax collectors and sinners. It was actually so offensive to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, that they asked his disciples, why does he eat with these people? And, and in, in that culture, eating together as it is today was really a sign of fellowship. It was a sign of saying, hey, I want to have a relationship with you. And Jesus goes and he reaches out to those people and he eats with them. Jesus' answer was, I have come for these people. I have not come for those who are righteous because they are observing religious rules. I have not come for those who see themselves as being righteous because they are able to keep all the do's and don'ts of the law. I have come for those who realize that they are not able to do what God requires. I have come for them. And he's willing to reach out, spend time, eat with them. In Luke chapter 7, in verse 34 to 39, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all the children. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster glass of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus 
described how the Pharisees, these religious leaders, responded to him. He is a glutton, he eats too much. He is a drunkard, he drinks too much. And he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, did Jesus really drink too much? Did Jesus ever get drunk? Jesus was without sin. So we know that first part of that statement is, is not true. But the second part of that statement is true. He was a friend of sinners. He was a friend of tax collectors. And that was offensive to them. I love how the fact we see here that when Jesus finds a Pharisee who's willing to build a relationship with them, Jesus is fine with that. He comes from that same group of people that are criticizing him, but when this Pharisee says, hey, come over to my house and eat with me, Jesus is like, hey, you know what, that's fine. So Jesus is ready to build friendships with those who society would say are right at the bottom, but he's equally ready to build a relationship with the self-righteous. Those who think that, hey, I, I actually know it all. I, I have kept the commandments. Because at some point, that self-righteous person, by the grace of God, will begin to realize that they can never do enough, and they need Jesus. But Jesus is willing to engage with any and every kind of person. So he goes to this man's house, but, but then a moment of tension is about to follow. Because as they get settled at the table, at that table of eating, this woman who is known for having a bad reputation, a woman of the city, as we've read, she comes in. And the Pharisees' plans are turned upside down. And this woman begins to show attention to Jesus. She washes Jesus' feet with her, with her tears and her hair. And she anoints him with what was in that flask. And, and the Pharisee says, you know, I think I was wrong about Jesus. Because if, if Jesus really knew what kind of woman this is that was doing this to him, mm -hmm. is he really the prophet that we think he is. And Jesus responds with the story. And he said, he tells the story of how actually the reason this woman is doing this is because she's so grateful that her sins have been forgiven. He says what, what she's doing is an expression of the fact that her sins, which yes, are like that, in me are forgiven. Jesus was a friend to the social outcasts. He was a friend to those who were openly looked down upon for their low moral standards. And, and the reality is, in, in our city, we have so many people that are doing things that if we look at, at morality and say, that is where the bar for morality is, and we look at how they live, we would say, you don't meet the bar. And Jesus would say, hey, you know what? I love that person. I love you. I came for you. I'm pursuing you. I want to have a relationship with you. Jesus was prepared to be criticized for his relationship with those people. He was prepared to be misunderstood. He was prepared to defend his relationship with them. For Jesus, being on mission, and, and we said last week that every one of us who is a follower of Jesus Christ is a missionary. All of us have been given this mission to reach people who are not following Jesus. For Jesus, being on mission was very much 
very much about building friendships, building relationships with people that are far from you. So, where does that leave us? Where does that put us in 2018 in Dar es Salaam? Well, we need to follow the example of Christ. We need to say, if that's what Jesus did, well, I don't like it. I, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's quite nice to just be in my Christian circles. And who knows what those people will expose me to. And maybe it's a bit frightening, it's a bit scary. And, but here's the thing, if, if that's what Jesus did, friends, that's what we must do. If that's how Jesus lived his life, that's how we should live our lives. In our neighborhoods, and in our places of study, in our families, in our places of work, wherever we find ourselves, our places of play, we, we should be cultivating, we should be intentionally Building relationships with people far from Jesus Christ. So we should come to a place where we are praying and saying, Lord, please show me someone that I can build a relationship with. Of the people I'm already in relationship with, Lord, please give me the courage to begin to build that relationship with the intention of one day showing them the love of Jesus Christ. That should be our heart response. And believe me, we can't do it in our own strength. We need God to do something inside of us. We need the Holy Spirit to give us the courage. We need God to change our thinking, to move us out of our comfort zone and say, hey, listen, you have a mission here on earth. Go and reach that person over there who does not know Jesus Christ. We often talk about evangelism and how evangelism is something that can be done well, we're going to do something some big program that's fine, we can do big programs but more than that we need a big heart and that can only come from God there's some other good reasons why we should build friendships with people that are not following Jesus. Firstly, we need to build these friendships because everyone is made for relationship. Every person is made for relationship. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every man passes his life in the search of a friendship. We build friendships because evangelism should be a way of life. It should be something that is part of who we are on a daily basis. We build friendships because people are skeptical of our message. And they're skeptical of us. It takes time to build trust. When we first moved to Dar, to plant God's tribe, I remember going to a function with a friend of mine, Kelvin, Kelvin and Belinda, who came with us to plant the church, they're now part of one tribe in Nairobi. And I went to a work function with Kelvin, and I met this guy, and I began to talk to him, and often these conversations end up with, so what do you do for a living? What, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm here to start a church. Uh, I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his immediate response was, wow, you are going to collect so much money in the office. <laughs> Everything I said about wanting the church to reduce to Sadaa. Everything. And people are skeptical. So we need to build trust by building relationships. We build friendships because coming to faith is a process. We need to walk a journey with people. Charles Arnold said this, and I'll end this section with this. There is a silver bullet that any congregation can use to reach more people. Silver bullets in quotes, because there really isn't a silver bullet. 
but he's trying to make a point here. Non-Christians come to Christ and the church primarily through relationships with Christians. Christian friends and relatives bring twice as many new believers into the kingdom as all the other reasons combined. So do we want to reach people who are far from Jesus? Yes? Let's build a relationship with them. And let's pray. And let's trust God to use us. And let's speak the word of God to them. Let's show them the love of Christ in the context of relationship. Secondly, how do we build relationships? How do we actually go about it? And again, we have to turn to Jesus Christ. And I'd like us to, to turn specifically to the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus and draw some things from there. Luke chapter 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. What do we see in how Jesus built his relationship with Zacchaeus? Well, firstly, Jesus greeted Zacchaeus. It started with Jesus saying, Zacchaeus. It was basically, hi, Zacchaeus. And that's often how relationships start. You start by saying hello. You start by saying hi. You start by acknowledging someone by name. And in our culture, in a context where we place great value on greeting, on saying hello, this should really work to our advantage. Because we're in a culture where people are quite keen to say hello. In fact, not greeting in our culture is considered to be rude. When you are in the presence of someone you don't know well, just start by saying hello. Just start by saying hi. For, for, for Trudy and I, we've lived, I think, in, in about five different neighborhoods in Dar in the last uh, five and a half years. And often what we do is when we move to a new neighborhood, we go to each and every one of our neighbors just to introduce ourselves. And say, hey, I'm Shashi and Trudy. We've recently moved into the neighborhood and we just wanted to say hi and meet you as our neighbors. And I, I'd love to have stories of how that relationship has continued to people coming to faith in Christ. I don't have one yet, but it's a start. Just going next door and saying hello to everyone, saying, hey, this, I just want to say hi, this is who we are. Secondly, Jesus made time for Zacchaeus. Jesus was actually only passing through Jericho. And there was a crowd that was there for him to meet with. But despite this temporary nature of Jesus' visit to Jericho and the many people that wanted to be in his presence, he makes time for one man called Zacchaeus. And you would think, really, Jesus, that guy, you know he's a tax collector, right? Don't you have better things to do with your time in Jericho? And Jesus makes time for Zacchaeus. If we are going to make friends with non-Christians, even in our busy schedules, and I know I'm speaking to busy people. I know I'm speaking to people who tomorrow morning you'll be up at 5 in the morning to be in the traffic by 5.30 and maybe late work at, from work at 9, 10 p.m. I sympathize with you. But here's the thing. You have a mission. To reach those who are not following Jesus. We need to make time. I have the privilege of spending a lot of time here on this Hopeback campus. 
And I try to intentionally make time for the fellow parents that I meet here. I could simply just say hi and off I go, but I actually try and stop and, and have a conversation, stop, have a conversation, in the hope that I am building a relationship, in the hope that one day some of those relationships may lead to an opportunity for the gospel to be presented. It's easy to come here and just hang out with those that I know. Or in any context, just find yourself gravitating to those you know. But we actually need to step out and begin to reach out to someone who looks different, someone we don't know, and begin to build those friendships. As Jesus did with Zacchaeus. Thirdly, Jesus spent time in Zacchaeus' house. He basically invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. He told him, I must stay in your house today. And it communicated something to Zacchaeus. It said to Zacchaeus that I want to take my relationship with you to the next level. I'm interested in you. My relationship with you isn't going to end just here on the street where there's lots of people. I want to come into your house and get to know your life and spend time with you. And this is, this has revolutionize my thinking a bit because I often think, well, you know, I need to have everybody come to my house. Jesus was quite okay with him saying, hey, can I come to your house? And actually, in, in, in the culture of our city, that's, that's quite common. People are quite happy for you to come to their house. Someone is sick, hey, please come to my house. They're going through a struggle, please come to my house. And often they, they, they're willing to have conversation around spiritual things. They're open to prayer. Open to you saying something that will bring hope. So we should, by the grace of God and with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, be, be, be coming to a place where we're willing to say, hey, can, I, can I come and see you at home? That communicates love, that communicates interest with that person that we are building a relationship with. And then finally, Jesus moved the relationship with Zacchaeus quickly. There was an urgency about Jesus wanting to connect with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Obviously the urgency was because Jesus was passing through Jericho. He didn't have a lot of time, but we can learn something about reaching out to those who are not following Jesus. We learn here that there is a sense of urgency in reaching people far from Christ because we do not know what tomorrow holds. We need to do something today. And you might think, isn't Zacchaeus going to be offended? Jesus, you are rushing him, telling him to come down the tree quickly, telling him you want to come to his house today. You know what? Zacchaeus comes down quickly and he receives Jesus joyfully. That's what the word says. You know, when God has begun to prepare someone's heart for the gospel, you'll be amazed at how they will be willing to receive you. They'll be willing to see that relationship grow because there's a yearning in their hearts for something better, something that only the gospel can satisfy. At Zacchaeus' house, Jesus said, Today, today, salvation has come to this house. Not tomorrow, not next week, today. The good news that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one who came into this world to die for our sins, to give his life for us, that good news that we could never save ourselves, but God sent his substitute, that message of salvation came into that house that day. One of the objections to Christianity is that Christians think they are better than everyone else. This is one of the things that keeps people away from, from Jesus. They look at Christians and they say, Christians are so judgmental, so holier than God. 
and, and, and people work it out in their heads. Why would I want to become one of them when what they do is judge other people? Why would I want to become one of them and then I'm going to be one of those who just judges others? And, it's, and it keeps people away from Christianity. This is true, unfortunately, in many cases, that that's what we do. But if we read the Bible, that's not the Jesus of the Bible that we are following. Jesus was willing to be a friend to everyone, even the most immoral in society. Perhaps you're here this morning and you have stayed away from Christianity. Because this is what we have seen in followers of Jesus. I want to say I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. Because a true Christian understands that everything they are in Christ is by grace. A true Christian understands that everything they are is because they got what they did not deserve, not what they deserve. It's because of God's love and forgiveness. And if that's you this morning, Jesus wants to be close to you. You see, He died for you. He loves you. And He wants to forgive you of every sin that you've ever committed and you will ever commit. And to my fellow followers of Jesus, if we are going to reach out to those who don't know Jesus, we need to build relationships with them. So let's pray and ask God to show us who He wants us to build those relationships with. When you go home today, continue praying. Make a list of those people that God will put on your heart. And then begin to step out, reach out, and build those friendships. Pray that God will save them. Pray that God will give us boldness to speak His word. Pray that God will use us to reach out to this lost world. Let's stand.